In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I am going to drop off my top 10 prospects for the 2024 draft. Of course, it is still early, it is still July, things can change drastically, but as of today, this is my top 10 prospects for next year's draft. Stay tuned to find out. There may be some surprises and there may be some consensus picks, but stay tuned to find out who I believe is the number one prospect for next year's draft. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. Got some weekend action for you. I am recording this late Friday night, and in a few hours, I am on my way back to Las Vegas. Definitely not my favorite place, but I'm going back to Las Vegas because I am headed to the Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence fight. I have a a pretty big interest in this fight. One, because it's the best fight in, in my generation that I think where you got the two best boxers in the sport, which, you know, that may be debatable. I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, which is where Terrence Crawford is from. But I spent the majority of my adult life in Dallas. And that's where Errol Spence is from. So I think it's going to be a great match. But yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. But there's no offseason on NBA Big Board, even though basketball is kind of winding down. This is the dead period, but not for me. No offseason. I'm going to talk about the draft three four, maybe even five days a week on the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast. And that's why I'm working on a late Friday night. And then I have another episode for you in a few hours. It is Richard Stamen's top 10 coming after mine. But all right, let's get into it. The number one player right now on my big board top 10 for the 2024 NBA draft is Justin Edwards from Kentucky. And I've talked about Edwards a couple times in past episodes if you missed it if you missed it and if you didn't hear it i'm going to give you why i am high on justin edwards number one he has the ideal positional size for a wing he's six eight six nine depending on who who you hear it from i guess we'll have to find out when kentucky has their pro day but i think he has good nba positional size and length he is versatile. I think he is going to be a potential three-level scorer in the NBA. He can shoot the deep ball. He can shoot the pull-up jumper. He can finish at the rim. I love his fluidity and coordination. And to me, fluidity and coordination is just as important as athleticism because there are plenty of players that are just vertically athletic, but they don't move well. And one of the things Edwards does is moves well. He handles the ball. He's a tough shot maker. And a tough shot taker, well, I guess he can be a tough shot taker and a tough shot maker, I guess in that order is probably the better sequence. But I love guys that can create off the dribble. And NBA teams covet wings that can shoot, defend, and put the ball on the floor. Like if you go down a list of all the wings in the NBA, can you name me 10 wings that can knock down open threes, attack a closeout, and switch and defend multiple positions. And the first names that come to mind are like a Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George. Four of those guys are on two teams. So there's not a bunch of guys in the NBA that can do all three. I mean, we've seen guys that can knock down open shots and defend, but they struggle attacking a closeout. We've seen guys that can defend and maybe put the ball on the floor and and score and create their own shot but they may not be good shooters and then we've seen guys that can do a little bit of both on offense but they can't defend the lick and i think justin edwards value is he will be able to defend at a high level knock down open shots create his own shots attack closeouts and finish at the rim that's why i'm so high on him i love the fact that he's a good transition finisher And he's active on the offensive glass, stuffs the stat sheet. I think he's going to, like I said, defend at a high level, get blocks, steals, rebounds. I don't know if he's a franchise changer, but I don't think there's a franchise changer in this draft class. But I think Justin Edwards is going to be an all-star. 
He had a positive assist to turnover ratio, so I think that there is plenty of upside for him as a playmaker and a passer. Now, the, the big concern or, you know, the, the potential drawback, I should say, is if he doesn't shoot the ball well, I think that could definitely hinder his opportunity to be the first pick. But I think if he shoots the ball well, I think he has a great chance to be the number one pick. A little bit concerned about the foul shooting. Not a great foul shooter. Some are concerned about his age because he's a little older for his class. But my response to that is three of the top five picks in the 2023 class, which was considered really strong, were also considered a little bit older for their class. So I really like Justin Edwards. I think that he's the number one player right now. Of course, it could change. And if you get a chance, watch Justin Edwards' film or highlights from the Peach Jam last year or some, some of the EYBL tournaments last year. And it's hard to say that there was a better player in the country than Justin Edwards. So that's why I have Justin Edwards number one on my list for my early, way too early preseason top 10. All right, at number two, I have Matas Bazoulas. And Matas is number two, which he could easily go number one. And of course, it's just going to depend on how well of a season that, that he has. And he, he has an interesting dynamic because he's playing for the G League Ignite. And I think that team is absolutely loaded. But Matas has... And if I said Justin Edwards has excellent positional size, Matas has, if, if there was a level above that. He's 6'11", 195, extremely skilled, especially for his size. Moves like a wing. He's very coordinated. He's fluid. He handles the ball like a guard. Does have some offensive creativity, which is something that I'm really high on. He moves it out the ball. Decent athlete. Good shooter. Shot 43% from three on based off the stats that I saw from Sunrise Christian Academy, I think that he has potential to be a versatile defender. He's a really good shot blocker. So he, he's this rare combination of a 6'11 wing that can protect the paint. Not saying that he can play the five or you can put him as your rim protector, but he can block shots, whether it's a weak side shot blocker and struggles a little bit of on ball defense. But I think with his, with his length and athleticism and timing, and with some experience, he's going to be a, a pretty good defender. Attacks the offensive glass. And based off the numbers that I have, he has 71 stocks, which is steals and blocks in 29 games. So, again, I think that he has good upside as a defender. The concerns, slim, 6'11", 195, pretty slim. And his frame doesn't look like he's going to be able to put on a lot of weight. But I think that he, he can be an effective player once he gains 20 to 30 pounds and, a, and, and, and be able to defend bigger players. I'm not too concerned about it, but I do think that he's going to have to get much, much stronger in order to be an efficient finisher at the rim. And he struggles playing through contact, which is definitely related to his lack of strength. Another concern is that, based off my numbers, he had 50 assists and 74 turnovers. So I think he's going to have to become a better decision maker. But again, you have to be intrigued by the tools. I watched him play at Basketball Without Borders in Salt Lake back in February. He was the best player in that group by far. I didn't walk away from that camp thinking, this, this is the dude. This is the number one pick. But I was convinced that he should be a top five pick, but we will see. But right now I have Matas Bazoulas at number two. All right, when we return, I want to talk about his teammate who I have currently at number three, but he is also someone that could go number one. I mean, there's a group of guys that could easily contend for the number one pick, and that is Ron Holland. Ron Holland from the Dallas area, someone that I've had a chance to watch and I've been monitoring him for the last few years. But before we get into Ron Holland, let's talk about FanDuel. And FanDuel is the official sports book partner for Major League Baseball and Locked On. And you can take your first swing at betting on Major League Baseball games on FanDuel, where you can get 10 times, again, 10 times. Your first bet amounts and bonus bets up to $200. That's right. If you just bet 20 bucks, you'll land $200 in bonus bets. Whether you win or you lose, that's 200 bucks that you can spend betting on everything from the money line to the over, the under. Who do you think is going to hit the first home run, the first triple, the first strikeout? 
You can bet on pretty much anything. A FanDuel, and it is all on the app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get your money instantly. Like, I, I know I hate waiting. So there's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. But if you sign up today and go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, you get up to $200 in bonus bets. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel. Again, the official sports partner, the official sports book partner of Major League Baseball and locked on. All right, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And in the next episode, which is already recorded and I'm ready to drop it, it is Richard Stamen, Mr. Mavs Magic Draft, and he's going to give his top 10 players for the 2024 NBA Draft class. I mean, again, it's way too early. His list looks a lot different than mine, which is expected. I mean, I, I, would, I wouldn't want us to have the same exact list. All right. Let's get into Ron Holland. So again, number one, I have Justin Edwards. Number two, Matas Bazoulis. And Ron Holland, who is also playing for the G League Ignite, is 6'8", 195-pound combo forward. I think he's a little bit more of a four than a three, but he has enough skill where you can see that he should develop into a, a three. But the, the best selling point about Ron Holland is he's a winner. I mean, he won state championships in three years. His last year at Duncanville High, I mean, there was a situation where they weren't able to play for in Texas. They kind of went the independent route. But Ron is a winner. That's one thing that he's done. He's won pretty much everywhere, whether it's in high school basketball. He's won in, in, in grassroots. He's won a couple gold medals representing Team USA. And he's an impressive athlete, has a quick first step, is an excellent slasher, and has what I call a V12 engine. He has an elite motor. I mean, he plays with so much energy. And my first time seeing Ron was a game, and I mentioned it in a previous podcast, where Duncanville played Ipsy Prep, which was a team that was featured in Monty Bates, and Holland made Imani work for every shot, and he finished with 18 points and 16 rebounds as a sophomore. He's an excellent rebounder, averaged 20 points, 10 rebounds this year. And again, he's 6'8", so he is someone that can defend multiple positions because of his length and athleticism, and he just changes and impacts game just off of his pure energy and effort. I've mentioned that he has a little bit of Sean Marion in his game, and I say that based off the fact that you don't have to run isolation plays from him, you don't have to run plays from him, and he can be the best player on the floor just off energy, effort, defense, finishing in transition, cutting, getting offensive rebounds. When you factor on how he impacts games without like a crazy polished offensive game, and then you figure he can add a more consistent jumper. He's already a pretty good ball handler, but he just doesn't waste any movements. There's there's no dancing with the ball. Ron is getting he's getting straight downhill, finishing, cutting. He's a respectable shooter at the prep ranks, but I think once all of that improves and he continues to build a little bit more offensive creativity to go with again the motor and the and the defense, then I think he's going to have a at least be an NBA All Star level. But again, he's a transition finisher, improving shooter, and aggressive downhill slasher. Has really good touch around the rim, finishes with soft touch finishes, and he is a very underrated passer. He is a, a ball mover. He just knows how to make the right play, knows how to win. Not someone that you can kind of put into a box as a three or a four, but one thing you can say is that he wins, he defends, and he just plays with great effort. Now the concerns are he does have a tendency to play out of control a little bit as far as like with his drives to the rim. Um, may not always see the second line of the defense. And then another concern is what is his best NBA position? That could be a concern. But overall, I have Ron Holland as number three on my list. All right. At number four, and this is going to be a surprise to some, I don't think I've seen anybody have him this high, but I'm really high and a big believer in El Marco 
Jackson. Now, El Marco has a unique situation because he's going to Kansas. And Kansas is, you know, depending on who you ask, the preseason number one. They're bringing back Dwan Harris. They got Arterio Morris, who was a McDonald's All-American last year, transferred to Texas. He's expected to play. You have Kevin McCullough Jr., who's coming back for, I believe this is year five for him. He's someone that I think would have been drafted, at the very minimum, been on a two-way if he decided to stay in the NBA draft. And then Kansas also has Hunter Dickinson. So they're going to be a very good team. So El Marco doesn't have a clear path to having the keys to the team. But I think by the end of the season, he's going to be Kansas's best player. I love his size, his burst. I mean, he has a good combination of speed, strength, and bounce. He is a above-the-rim finisher, a highlight reel finisher above the rim. Once he gets to his launching pad, I mean, if you're a defender, watch out because he will put you on a poster. But again, I just love the combination of speed, burst, athleticism. He's a bouncy athlete. He's fast in the open floor, good transition finisher. Shifty, again, I love shifty ball handlers. And he can get to his pull-up jumper. He's not one of these guys that is fast and athletic but only has one speed. He knows how to stop and pop, elevate over smaller defenders, gets, gets to his pull-up jumper. And I think that he is going to be a three-level scorer in the NBA. I don't understand why he doesn't have the same hype. I mean, he was a McDonald's All-American. I just feel like he's a little bit underrated. It may be people are thinking that Kansas is going to go with with their veterans, in a sense, over, over their freshmen. But I think he's just too good to keep off the floor. Maybe a situation where the flashes alone, because it's all about potential and upside, the flashes alone will put him in position to be a top 10, top 5 pick. And in my case, I got him a number 4. But again, I love how he can create space off the dribble. He has a good handle, quick first step, pressures the rim. I'm all about guys that pressure the rim. And he's a defender. That is one thing that you consistently hear about him is that he is a defender. Spoke to a scout recently, and he said that El Marco is one of the rare freshman guards that comes in and competes and defends, and you know you're going to get a good defensive effort out of him. So that's another reason I like him. The concern is the assist to turnover ratio wasn't great on the high school level, so he is going to have some strides to make or some improvements to make as a playmaker and he's probably not going to play a lot on the ball at Kansas this year so I think that is a situation where he's going to have to develop into a, a floor general in the pros but again El Marco Jackson for me at number four all right I want to talk about Isaiah Collier I have Isaiah at number five and this is a a player that I have some concerns about. He's one of the best passers in this draft class. Loves to get downhill. Is a dynamite scorer. I mean, I thought that he was the best player at the McDonald's All-American game, even though it is a, a glorified All-Star game. I thought he was the best player. I love how he's always in attack mode. He's aggressive. He now he loves to get downhill. Has a strong frame. It's kind of like a, a power guard in a sense. Like the way he explodes, you, you think of him like, I see uh, like a football player's mentality. The way he likes to get downhill and his toughness has good burst, first step. Now, even though he has birth, burst and strength, he's not an above the rim finisher. He is a below the rim finisher, which can be a little bit of a concern, but he loves to play fast, loves to push in transition generates a lot of fouls with just his aggressiveness and how assertive he is so he can put up points on the board pretty quickly and he's unafraid of contacts actually initiates the contact and again i love his motor and the fact that he's always in attack one and he's not one of these guys that's going to bail out the defense by shooting jumpers but on the flip side of that is i have real concerns about his jumper because I think he's really going to struggle. I think he's a guard that has always had the ball in his hands and he's never really had to shoot jumpers. I actually had a chance to watch him work out in Las Vegas um, during summer league and I was 
I came to watch somebody else at, at Impact and then he showed up. So I sat and watched him shoot for about an hour. I think it's going to be an uphill climb for him to be a reliable shooter this year. But I think it's simply because he's never really had to be a good shooter because he can dominate the games and dominate the prep levels by getting downhill and getting fouls. I mean, he is a foul magnet. My concerns, the turnovers are a little bit concerning. The outside shooting is the main thing. I think he does have a tendency to like hunt for highlights, look for highlight reel plays instead of making the simple play. And some believe that he is someone because of his build that down the line he may have some some issues keeping the weight off because he's a, a powerful guard and he's already physically mature at such a young age and I did speak to a scout and and the scout didn't say it as if he knew about his eating habits or anything like that but he was just saying if you look at his frame once he gets money he's going to have to make a little bit harder of a conscious effort to keep the weight off to keep his burst and speed because he could easily pick up weight after you know being active for a couple weeks during between the the end of the season and the off season but that's just the concern of a scout but overall isaiah collier have him at number five or there are some people that think he has a chance to contend for number one all right when we return i want to talk about donovan Klingon, another guy that a very respected NBA mind told me that he thinks Donovan Klingon has a chance to go number one. I'll talk about Klingon when we return. All right, last segment. And I talked about Klingon in a previous episode as the, one of the top returning players. And I think that there's an outside chance that he could be the number one pick, despite the fact that he's not your modern big in a sense. He's not a floor spacer. He's not someone that is a great passer, doesn't put the ball on the floor. He's kind of like a traditional big, definitely has the size of a traditional back to the basket big. He's seven foot two. I mean, he is massive, but he is the epitome of a defensive anchor. When Donovan Klingon is on the floor, team's offense completely changes. I mean, he completely shuts down the paint. One of the best shot blockers in the nation and even though he only played about 13 minutes per game, was a crazy rebounder and shot blocker. I think this year, with the, the center position of his, I wouldn't be surprised if Donovan Klingon averages like 14, 11, and three or four blocks per game. And he is a defensive anchor. I do think the success of Kessler, or Walker Kessler, um, helps out Donovan Klingon. And I spoke to a the, the same mind, respected basketball mind that, that believes that Klingon has an outside chance of being number one. He mentioned how Walker Kessler, the impact that he had as a rookie helped out Derek Lively. Even though Lively was not as productive, averaged like five points and five rebounds or something like that. Even though he wasn't as productive as Walker Kessler, it helped him out the success because he can block shots and rebound and defend. So um, Walker Kessler went number 22 in the 2022 NBA draft and Derek Lively ends up going number 12 in the 2023 NBA draft. Now, if Lively has an impact for year for the Mavericks, I think that's going to even boost the stock of Donovan Klingon even more because he's bigger may not be as athletic, light off his feet, but he is a very, very good rim runner, and he, he's a vertical lob threat. He's a good athlete. So I think that he is probably probably going to be the most impactful player in this draft, and definitely on the defensive end. I think he has a chance to be player of the year. All right, at number seven, so I got, I got Donovan Klingon at number six. At number seven, I have another sophomore, and it is Tyrese Proctor. Proctor is another guy that I've talked about a little bit at length over the past week or so because I'm really high on Proctor. Love his offensive creativity. Absolutely love the shiftiness, the shot making. I mean, I've seen him just kind of dance on defenders, but I mean, he just throws guys off with the ball handling 
And I haven't even talked about the passing. I think he is a really good passer. Show flashes of it at the end of the year when Duke kind of gave him the keys to the offense. But I really like Tyrese Proctor. I like what he brings to the table as far as his size. He has good size at 6'5". Again, a good passer. I think he's a much better shooter than the numbers indicate. And he got off to an absolutely horrible start to his freshman year, but finished respectable from three. Um, shot 38% on jumpers off the catch and 45% on, con on uncontested jumpers off the catch. So I think the shooting is there. But again, I like his size. Good athlete, not great athlete, but good enough to get to his spots. He has good straight line speed. Again, I, I talked about him being a shifty ball handler. At the minimum, he's going to be a 6'5 guard that can play out of pick and rolls and has good drive and kick vision, but I think he's a much better playmaker than just a drive and kick passer. Again, good shooter when his feet are set. He is a rebound and run threat, and his size allows him to defend multiple positions. The concern is he just wasn't a really good finisher at the rim. Shot 53% at the rim. I think that's definitely going to have to improve. But some of that could be to Duke's lack of spacing. I mean, Lively didn't shoot threes. Kyle Filipowski was playing the four. He shot like 28% from three. And, you know, as a kid, I remember Duke was a team where you always thought they had shooters. And for the, for the past few years, that has been Duke's biggest problem is that they just haven't had really good shooters. And so I think if he had better shooters around him and better spacing, then I think he could be a better finisher at the rim. But I do want to see him make some improvements around the basket. I think he kind of struggled a little bit, especially early in the year, reading defenses. I thought he kind of drove without a plan and played too fast. But overall, the way he finished, if you divide a season into two parts, the first half of the year and the second half of the year, he was a totally, totally different player. And for example, against, I want to say it was against Miami, and it was another team that he played real well against in the conference tournament, and then he finished with 16 points against Tennessee in Duke's uh, NCAA tournament game, and he was the best player on the floor that night for Duke. So I'm really high on Tyrese Proctor, who is an Australian-born playmaker. And Australia has something in the water where they're creating or building or developing these big plus size playmakers from Ben Simmons to um, Dyson Daniels, Josh Giddy. If you're a big playmaker in that academy or whatever development they have going in Australia, you're more than likely going to be a, a pretty good passer and know how to run a team. So I love the way Australia has developed these positionless big guards and playmakers. All right, so that is number seven. And number eight, a guy that I'm high on, Stefan Castle. Now, he actually reminds me of Markel Fultz. Now, if he is Markel Fultz, I'm talking about University of Washington Markel Fultz, he has a chance to be the number one pick. Good size at 6'6". Six, six. I love his pace and his patience. Like, he just plays at his own speed. You're not really rushing him. He's a good athlete, but his game is not based off of athleticism. He just knows how to get to his spots. Crafty score off the dribble. I think that he has potential as a three-level scorer. And with his ball handling and his offensive creativity and his advanced handle, I think that's going to be really easy for him to, to get to his spots, whether it's to the mid-range or get to the rim and knock down open shots. Again, not very explosive, but a good athlete. I think that he's going to be a good pull-up shot maker. He scores off the dribble. I love the way he uses his size to his advantage. I like his promise as a playmaker and a passer. I think he does a good job of finding open shooters. At the minimum, he's a driving kick passer, a guy that gets into the paint and finds bigs on dump-offs. But I like the passing and I like the size and passing because it allows him to see over the top of smaller defenders. Now, the concerns, not a great elite first step. His shooting mechanics are a little bit different. Not too concerned about that, but it is a little bit of a concern. And the reason why it is somewhat of a concern is because he's not a really great foul shooter. He is kind of like El Marco Jackson in the sense where you, you see the, the, the promise of the three, as a three-level scorer. 
but then you look at the free throw shooting and you wonder is he a little bit further away as a shooter than the numbers actually indicate but castle from uconn uconn has two guys that i think could go into the top 10. now i don't know if they'll be as good as last year's team which you know last year's team won the national championship but i think they'll have more or they'll have more first round picks than last year's team all right at number nine it is dj wagner and dj wagner is someone that a lot of people may have in the top five i like wagner i just have some concerns about his position but let's talk about what i like about him and his strengths he is a creative and crafty scorer love the mindset the mindset is I'm here to kill. I'm here to get buckets. If, if you're guarding him, you're not getting a night off because he's going to be aggressive. He's going to be assertive. He's going to make sure that he has his fingerprints all over the game. I love how he changes speed. I mean, he's just a crafty scorer with excellent, excellent scoring instincts. Quick first step. Again, aggressive downhill slasher. One of these righties that plays lefty. I don't know if he was born to where he is naturally lefty but he shoots righty or is he a right-handed person and his dad and 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 whoever like played an important role of his in his development was telling him how important it is to be able to go to his left but he loves to play like a lefty but the jumper's righty so crafty there show some flashes of court vision and is a good foul shooter and with his aggressiveness and how much he likes to get to the line he is someone that you feel comfortable with late in the game giving him the ball because he's going to make the right play and if a team is trying to foul he's going to knock down the foul shots now the concerns are what is his natural position can he develop into a one is he a combo if he's a combo is he going to be like a six man that just provides instant offense off the bench another concern is he's not as good of a shooter as you would like for him to be and I think that, I mean, it's definitely an area for development, but I think he's going to have to improve as an outside shooter and then a little bit turnover prone. And again, what position is he? Is he a one? Can he develop into a one? Is he an undersized two? Or is he, again, your, your combo guard that comes off the bench that runs the second unit and it's just instant offense. And so I guess only time would tell. All right, at number 10, the last player in my top 10 is DJ Wagner's high school teammate, Aaron Bradshaw. Now, Aaron Bradshaw is out with a foot injury, but he is someone that I think has the tools, has the tools to be a top five, top 10 pick. Doesn't get the same buzz and, and hype, but I mean, it's easy to be overshadowed when you're playing with DJ Wagner. But Bradshaw is seven foot, he's long, he's agile, he's a good athlete, has the NBA positional size, a soft touch around the rim, he can run the floor. I think that he has a really high upside as a floor spacer. A little thin, but he should be able to add weight, he has good hands, he can score around the basket. May not be someone early in his career that you'd like dump the ball to and, and tell him to go get you a bucket which i think he can it's just the that he's so thin that he's going to get pushed out of his sweet spots but he is a guy that has a pretty decent motor he scores the offensive rebounds and putbacks can be a vertical lob threat again i think that once he puts on weight he'll be more effective not the most physical guy doesn't um yeah, I, I'll just say that he's not the most physical guy. So that can be a little bit of a concern. And he still shows flashes of being a shooter, but he still seems a little raw from time to time. But I think the outside shooting is the key. I know John Calipari has mentioned that he shoots threes and he's probably going to run a two big lineup, maybe three. And, and then I'm hearing that Kentucky may add a fourth big to the roster, which would be a big get a big fine but it'd be pretty interesting how they rotate all those guys but then it also makes me wonder two of their bigs have foot injuries and are the foot injuries a little bit more serious than we thought for them to try to bring in another big man in the international class but i think aaron bradshaw if he puts it together he is going to be like your shot blocking 
rim protecting, I guess that's the same thing, but like your, your rim protecting defensive anchor, that can be a vertical lob threat, but also space the floor. And there's value in that. So that's why I have Aaron Bradshaw at number 10. But the player that he didn't make my top 10, but I had to talk about him because I think that he can be inside the top 10 around draft time. And it is Riley Kugel. Riley is a super athletic shot maker that shot well from three off the catch, off the dribble. And I think that he's going to have a huge, huge year for Florida. So right now he didn't make my top 10, but he could easily be inside the top 10 a week from now, a month from now, and, and definitely on draft day. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. Again, this is my top 10 as of now. And in the next episode, Richard Stamen is going to share his top 10. And we definitely differ on a few players, most notably DJ Wagner. But stay tuned to find out Richard's thoughts on his top 10 players in 2024. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, and I am out.